Hello, my friends, and welcome back. <sighs> Today, we're going to be examining the age-old question, what does obesity mean? And the person that's going to help us with this is Aubrey Hoffer, MA. She's got a Master of Arts. We'll be taking a look at a few videos from this person today. Uh, uh. What does obesity mean? To answer this question, let's go all the way back to classical antiquity, ancient Greece and Rome. So we're going to be um, experiencing extraordinary levels of vocal fry here, like Hannah levels, maybe even exceeding Hannah levels of vocal fry. In a time of relative prosperity, there was a lot of anxiety about what abundance means. Moderation and balance became virtues, and- Virtues. How do you vocal fry the word virtues? Any sign of an excess was a flaw that needed to be corrected. And you disagree with this? You think living in excess is good? When it came to eating, overindulgence was seen as a moral failing. Food is meant to be fuel, not pleasure. Well, I don't know if it was even that. Back then, just as today, it is seen as perfectly reasonable to enjoy food to a certain degree. But then once it becomes like a crutch and a thing that you're constantly abusing, because there's a difference between enjoying and abusing, uh, when you start abusing it, that's, that's where the difference comes in. So fatness became a symbol for moral corruption. It became a symbol for moral corruption. Which leads to the Latin word obesus. <laughs> the Latin word obesus? <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Which means having eaten until fat. <laughs> the explanation is even better. And the look on her face right now. How can you, um, how can you say, so the word is obesus with uh, the definition having eaten until fat. How can you say that with a straight face and then not start busting out laughing? You still have the most serious look on your face that I've ever seen. You're like, yeah, no, this is real. This is, this is real science we're talking. Jesus. In the grand scheme of things, demonizing fatness is an anomaly that has really been limited to only a few time periods. Uh, well, the amount of obesity that they had back then was starkly different than what we have today, madam. Never before in history have we had the levels of obesity that we have today. It wasn't even possible to get that big on ancient diets. Only with the advent of modern processed carbs and sugar is the human body able to achieve 600 pounds, 700 pounds, and up. So, the ancients knew nothing of real obesity. And even with the smaller amount of obesity that they were exposed to, they still saw it as unacceptable because they're like, yo, you just keep eating. Thine body is already fat, but thou keepst eating? Perplexed I am. But as we know, history is told through the eye of the victors. History is told through the eye of the victors. So, um, fat phobia won out in the end, and now all the history that you're being taught is lies. It's all propaganda told by the fat phobic victors of the history books. Next clip. Recently I had a comment where somebody asked, why are you mad at the diet industry? Shouldn't you be mad at the things that made you fat? The diet industry is currently worth a record high of over $72 billion right now. So that's a no then? You're not gonna be mad at the things that made you fat? I like how you just duck the question entirely. People are like, why aren't you mad at the stuff that made you fat? You know, like the food that you ate and the food companies that create the food. And you're all like, did you know that the diet industry is worth yada, 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 billion? And you're like, okay, cool. I, I, um, I appreciate that fact. Thank you for filling me in. However, there was the part where I asked you the question. Why aren't you mad at the companies that are selling the fattening food? Or at yourself for consuming it? You're mad at the boogeyman diet industry, which nobody is forcing you to partake in, by the way. The diet industry exists only because obesity exists. So I think you're demonizing the wrong industry here. Almost 70% of Americans have been on some form of diet at some point in their lives. Okay, so? So what? What percentage of Americans are obese, currently overweight in some kind of way? Most people are overweight, actually. Mm. 
not obese like most people aren't quite that far but the vast majority of people have a few extra pounds there is strong evidence suggesting that chronic dieting is the precursor to disordered eating okay and uh how many people die from disordered eating versus how many people die from obesity I bet you uh, quite a few more people die from the obesity rather than the disordered eating. So I guess it's a risk that's worth taking, isn't it? We need to weigh risk to reward here. If uh, you not doing anything about your weight will cause certain death, and then you weigh that against the option of, oh, I might develop a restrictive ED if I watch what I eat a little too much. And, um, you know, a much lower percentage of people actually die from that than obesity. Well, then I guess you would take the least dangerous option, which would be go ahead and get on that diet and start watching what you eat to uh, get that obesity under control. Some would argue that chronic dieting is disordered eating. The majority... Uh, well, whether or not going on all these fad diets and failing on them repeatedly is disordered eating is neither here nor there. Of American women engage in some kind of disordered eating, and at least a fraction of them would be clinically diagnosed with having eating disorders. Disorders. So, so what? You're more likely to die from the obesity, like I said. I was talking about cisgender women. However, these behaviors are also on the rise among cisgender men and trans people in general. Eating disorders are incredibly deadly and incredibly pervasive. That's why it's important to talk about them. Sure, I mean, I guess it's important to talk about them, but it's also important to talk about obesity and how it's far deadlier than eating disorders. I'm not saying you should have an eating disorder. Uh, that's not a proper remedy to being obese at all. That's just another extreme that is also unhealthy. Somewhere in the middle exists health. Somewhere between the extremes of obesity and restrictive eating disorders, there exists health in the middle, where we can still watch what we eat, go to the gym, work out, look after our physique, check ourselves out in the mirror, see if we're getting a little too fat in the ass, or see how our abs are looking or whatever, without going completely off the rails, okay? And it has more to do with body image issues than it does with counting calories or being too obsessive about your diet. Trust me, most people that have a restrictive ED, it stems from body image issues. What they see in the mirror is not an accurate representation of what they actually look like. Here's the next clip. I do not support calorie counting, and I want to talk a little bit about why. Is it because you're going to say it causes restrictive EDs again? Just like everything else causes a restrictive ED so we can't partake in it. This is like the same mentality that uh, nobody should ever have a beer because you might develop alcoholism. I mean, yeah, sure, some people will have a problem with alcohol and they will have a problem controlling how much they drink. But for a lot of people, they'll be just fine having a couple beers. Shit, they'll be fine having a couple beers every weekend and uh, it'll never grow to be more or out of control or anything like that. Some people will just go to the gym every morning and uh, get healthy and uh, feel good because they went to the gym and that'll be the end of that. Some people will go to the gym and get completely out of control and go buy a bunch of steroids and become obsessed with their body and get bigorexia, which is the opposite of the other one where you feel like you're never big enough and you just keep lifting weights and stuff. There are extremes to be found within anything. To be clear, because people get very defensive about this, you can do whatever you want. But in my experience, calorie counting has been the precursor to disordered eating. In your experience? So you were counting calories and then you developed disordered eating? By the way, why is your TikTok name Hoff.PhD? Uh, the thing I was looking at a moment ago said that you had an MA, which is a Master of Arts. Also, that doesn't make anything that you say relevant. Even if you had the greatest degree on earth, if you told me the sky was red, I would still uh, have to argue with you. And both myself and pretty much everyone who I've ever talked to about disordered eating. Calorie ca Well, the real problem with disordered eating is that um, a bunch of obese people are saying that they have this problem when they don't. Well, they do, but they have it in the other way. They have the, uh, the one where you eat too much. 
counting can be very easy to obsess over because you basically have this arbitrary number that you're supposed to be meeting every day, or rather than meeting, it's framed as not exceeding. Be right, and that ca that can cause some people to obsess, you know? I, I can see how that could lead some people to obsessive behavior. However, as I said, I believe that most people develop uh, restrictive EDs because of body image issues like body dysmorphia. Because if you exceed that amount of calories, that's viewed as failure. And there's a lot of like fear mongering about calories where it's like you need to eat as few calories as humanly possible. Is that how counting calories works? Well, I wasn't aware that that's how you count calories. You eat as few calories as humanly possible. Um, then what's the counting part? <laughs> Where's the counting come in if you just, just eat as few calories as possible? You can do that without doing any math at all. Just have like one almond for the whole day. And uh, I don't think you could get any less calories than that. Or maybe if you had like, maybe if you had half an almond. Like who would imagine that that could result in disordered eating? I think it's a lot healthier. To I don't know why people that are overweight are so deathly afraid of developing disordered eating. They're like, God, oh, I can't develop disordered eating. Anything but that. Anything but that. I don't want to develop disordered eating. Like, dude, what you're doing is very disordered. You're demonizing the disordered eating that is on the opposite end of the spectrum from the disordered eating that you were doing. It's very bizarre. It's like when people that have a restrictive ED watch my videos to laugh at overweight people. It's very bizarre. If you have any sort of ED, uh, you shouldn't be throwing stones. You live in a glass house. Do not count calories and eat the foods that make you feel the best. The best. Eating the foods that make you feel the best means eating foods that are healthy. Eating foods that taste good do not make you feel good. They just taste good on your tongue for two seconds. And not to demonize foods because they're high calorie. All right, time for the final clip. Sometimes I will get called a science denier because I question science. This is not true. Whenever I talk about body size and health, people get very impassioned and very angry. They'll say, isn't it common knowledge that people with more body fat percentage have a greater risk of heart attacks or higher mortality or whatever? And I'll say, hey, you know, some of the science here is a little bit questionable. And then almost always they will send me the first article that comes up when you Google body fat and heart attacks or whatever. Then I will question the science and I will say, well, here are some of the issues with how these researchers conducted these experiments. And then they will call me a science denier. Then I will send them an article that says that people in the overweight BMI category have a lower mortality rate than people in the lower weight categories. To which they're like, well, no, obviously there's a lot of complexities with science. If you're only willing to acknowledge complexities when it refutes your points and then think science is irrefutable when it confirms your bias, that's a problem. That's very ironic that you said that that's a problem when they do it, when you're doing exactly what you accused them of doing. There are countless articles talking about how being obese is unhealthy, and then you're hanging on to the one article that says that it might actually be good for you, and then you're accusing this other person of doing the same exact thing. They're like, science is complex and this and that and blah 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 blah. Probably they didn't even say that. They probably said, um, your so-called science is nonsense. I have thousands of articles, and we have tons and tons of information about how deadly obesity is, and you're presenting to me one joke of an article written by somebody that went to Massey University. And the irony of you accusing this person of having the bias that you very clearly have is delicious. This person's pretentiousness is on par with Hannah, and so is their vocal fry. I think you'll find that those two go hand in hand. Anybody that talks like this uh, often has some kind of nonsense degree and loves the smell of their own farts. Anyway, that about does it. Thanks for watching, commenting, liking, and subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.